I would say it's okay to be cynical. I would say it's not okay to be complacent. So what other choice do you have, really? I mean, you can sit by and do nothing or you can make an effort. But it's okay to have a little cynicism in there. It's okay to be um, negative sometimes. It's okay to be even angry. Uh, but just don't, don't sit by and be idle. Uh, how many folks are aware uh, that the Olympics were uh, making an attempt to uh, come here to Boston in 2024? Remember that, remember that. That is no longer happening. One of the reasons that is no longer happening is a group was put together, in part by Kelly Gossett, who we're going to bring up right now. She was co-chair of the No Boston Olympics. That organization successful, and she's going to talk to us now a little bit about who she is, what she does, and what happened with No Boston Olympics. Um, I got involved in the Olympics um, effort uh, July of last year. Chris and Liam thoughtfully um, put this organization together um, of December of 2013. And it started with really a brief question of, is this a good idea for Boston? At that time, last year, there was not a lot of conversation about it whatsoever. It was kind of a rumble out in the distance. And the idea that this could come to Boston sounded only at that time as a good idea for people. And the idea that Olympics could be bad, which is now kind of everyone might concede it could be, um, was not being talked about at all. So we um, got together. I think Sarah, was here, who's here too, um, actually introduced me to Liam. And we met at a Panera and got together and decided how can we uh, strategize against 2024. Now, at that time, um, we put together a website. I think we had the logo, which is really cool, and had gotten some facts and theory together, but not a lot of um, media attention was given to us at that time. The questions that I got asked a lot was, what are you thinking? Um, this is a crazy idea, and not only um, is this gonna be bad for you and bad for your career, but you guys are gonna lose, and you're gonna lose big. I heard that pretty much all of last year, all last summer and all last fall and winter, um, which was really challenging. It's a risky proposition to go against um, some of the biggest titans in this town, and so, it is what it was. I didn't stay involved to be recalcitrant. It was really an empty microphone, and we realized we needed somebody out there to be providing that other story about the Olympic effort. Um, we thought we did a pretty good job of convincing the USOC not to choose us. Um, turns out we did not. They chose us in January, and from that moment on, everything changed pretty dramatically, actually. Um, my life has never been the same since. Um, we went into overdrive pretty quickly. Um, at that time, I think we realized, though, yes, we were courageous, but, I mean, if you're courageous to start, you better be strong enough to finish. So we had to get a strategy together pretty quickly. One strategy might be described as guerrilla warfare, which is a military term where a small, mobile, you know, regular unit takes on a more traditional infantry. That could definitely be described of what we were up to. Um, utilizing our weaknesses is actually strengths. Um, 2024 had all of the money, all of the big consultants in town, all of the, um, the, the glitz and glamour. They had an office, they had <laughs> computers, they had staff. We didn't have any of those things. Um, but uh, we could be fast and we could be agile. I think we put out messaging pretty swiftly, which was a real important tactic in this. Um, we were able to... Um, get our message out while 2024 often was giving very conflicting messages. They had different points um, pretty often, and we took advantage of that. Another tactic would be the fact that social media, you can't downplay that. That was enormous. Um, we hear often about the 10 people on Twitter, but digital strategy is a, just a game changer now. It helped us get our message out there, and we realized, and we saw this from the polling, that the more people learned about the bid, the less they liked it. So we just needed to make sure we got as much information out there to as many people as quickly as possible. Um, and we did that pretty effectively, I think. Another piece that comes up a lot is this idea that we weren't personal. Uh, and I think I, I get frustrated with that idea. Yes, no, we weren't, we weren't per personal. We weren't going after anybody's motivations necessarily. The people at 2024 
and the mayor's office are great people, and they're very successful, and they're the best of Boston, and the most powerful of Boston for a reason, but of course it's personal. It's politics, it's policy. I think we tried to keep the vitriol out, but one example I'd say is probably the meeting we met with the mayor, one of the first times it was snowing. It snowed every day, it snowed all the time this winter. Um, we, and we came in and like, we're on the opposite ends of this. This is a really challenging multi-billion dollar effort and we obviously don't see the same um, outcome here. And he was great, gave us a lot of time, he and his staff often throughout the winter and I brought in, just as a joke, a little snow globe as like a gesture. And I think that kind of thing, he laughed obviously and I think it's still there on his desk and he was supposed to go away I think on vacation and chose not to instead and stayed in Boston to deal with all the snowstorms, which illustrates his priorities are with the people of Boston. But I think we tried to um, professionally uh, work with everybody and dissent's incredibly important and it's okay to have a dif disagreement and a differing point of view on this very important issue. Um, I know I don't have much time, so I need to wrap up, but um, the last bit I think of in terms of this, in terms of questions, comes up a lot. We were, in a, we were really lucky. We worked obviously very hard, and it's, we're really grateful that we were successful in this effort. Um, one piece that is often brought up, though, and I quibble with this, is that uh, we were willing to ask tough questions, and we say that often, even MBO says that often about even elected officials or 2024, and what frustrates me a bit about that is that tough questions should be the start, it should not be the end all be all. Um, that is not, it, maybe it was courageous to do that, but we should all be doing that, that's how I got involved in this work, this is our city, this is our state, we should be all asking those tough questions and um, it's not only our right, it's our responsibility. So let's make, let's, we're grateful we won and all, but maybe we all can use this successful David Goliath story to do this again in another big effort. Um, I'm grateful that we won and very um, surprised still, but hopefully it's an inspirational tale for all of us for the next issue that comes down. So I hope I stayed in time, so thank you. Hang on to that, hang on to that, hang on to that. We're gonna talk for a little bit, we'll just, just quickly. Uh, so, w w were you ever intimidated? I mean, you're talking about the idea that there are these huge power brokers, really yeah. big players, very rich, important people, and you were like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna take them on. Like, was that scary Well, ever? We, I, we say this often, we had the facts on our side. I think it was an issue where more people need to learn about the USOC process or the IOC. Yeah, you don't want to go against the uh, established elite and be ridiculous, but I think if we could be reasonable and polished, I think it was, was okay. And I think this is a good example where you can agree to disagree and it's okay. So, yes, of course, at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you have this idea that, that you sort of... I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it, you have truth on your side. You sort of felt like, all right, we're kind of on the right sure. side right side of this thing. Um, and so that, that'll take you so far. Yeah. And then the idea of we have to be strategic about getting people to understand the sort of facts. That, that, that's sort of this whole other ball of wax, right? Mm -hmm. was, there, was there much that changed in the way you did things as you went along? Did you guys learn as you were going along and say this is working, this is not working, we need to shift here, we need to do this different thing here? Um, I think uh, swift messaging in terms of making sure people knew about the risk piece, that just saying it over and over and over and over again um, really helped. That was, I think, very important because people, assume, the first time they heard it, we've said it 2,000 times, so there's still a lot of information out there. We did it in a pretty quick manner, though. When you think about it, I mean, it was only six months that we were able to kind of dismantle this. So I think um, the strategy would have changed had we gone past probably September. Did there, uh, were there low points? Or did you guys always feel like from the outset Oh my you God, you where's Chris? <laughs> where's Liam? Yeah, it was, it's been the biggest year professionally and personally, table over there knows all about that. And it's so much, this has been a very challenging year. The, probably the worst night was one of the, the night of JP. Um, when I was, I texted you, and where, I don't know where Chris went, there he is. Um, I, I didn't like the meetings very much, and they were just really caustic, um, really hard to do and get through. And uh, when I left one of them, I was attacked on the street by a woman, physically, screaming, physically? I mean, oh, like she was right in my face, screaming, 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 screaming. And 
was like, you don't, you're not from here. You don't get to tell me about the Olympics. I don't want the Olympics. I was like, neither do I. I was like, actually, she was on my side. She just wanted to make sure you she knew that screamed at she me knew you are not totally from here. All the way to, to the T. And I got on the T and I was just shaking and I was like, I can be kind of like, you know, but I, I still don't want to like scream at her. I'm not going to like fight with a woman. It was horrible. And I got on the T and I've got my sunglasses on. And I'm just crying. I was like, I don't know. What <laughs> I thought I was on the right side here. What am I doing? I've lost my mind. So yeah, no, there were definitely low moments, but it's still like we won, so it is. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Final question: When did when did you know? When did you guys know? Well, I say this. I won't speak for Liam and Chris. I did not know until it, you don't. You play through the whistle. You never know. You don't stop until you know that it's literally done. But I mean, that weekend it was pretty. We it, it finished on a Monday. It was pretty obvious that something was up that weekend in July. Felt good. Felt great. It still feels good. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Gossett, no Boston Olympics, everybody. So uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about what does a campaign manager do? Um, we, have some, uh, we have some idea that they're there sort of helping uh, steer the ship. And I, I think what a campaign manager really does is make decisions all day for the length of the campaign, uh, large and small, because by definition, campaigns are time limited. You're not... You have, a, you have a date by which everything must have happened. And everything is a choice. Uh, the materials you put on your website and the color of your bumper stickers and where you're going to spend Saturday morning. Is it in Chelmsford or is it in Falmouth? And you have to choose everything. And some campaigns make the mistake of having the candidate make those choices. Uh, but then the candidate's not being the candidate. The candidate is making, spending all their time making decisions. So I think that is really what a campaign manager does, is make decisions and then ask other people to make lots of decisions all the time. Um, one of the biggest decisions and the hardest decisions to make is not to spend any money whatsoever if you can help it, because you will need all of it. Um, we live in a in a time when there's a lot of discussion of how much money there is in politics, and it's a, and it's a shame. Um, and one day we will have a new Supreme Court that gets rid of this ridiculous uh, constitutional right of corporations. But in the meantime, yeah. all right, yes, get rid of Citizens United. Um, but in, but in the meantime, we, we live in a world where this is, this is what you need to do, and, and candidates are not... Uh, are not rule makers, they are game players, and so you have to compete. Um, and what I think uh, was the, what, one question we get asked a lot is, well, how, how did you win? How did you do it? And there are a few different answers to that. I think one is we ran a very message disciplined campaign. And this is, I think, instructive for people who are thinking about being involved in campaigns. Certainly, no Boston Olympics is a great uh, example of this, but we took a look at uh, who Mora was and what her experience had been. And for those of you who don't know, she had spent eight years as an attorney general in the attorney general's office, as a, as a line attorney, you know, doing the work. And although we've had, we've elected AGs before who have had that experience, we've never once elected somebody who just came straight up through the ranks. So we had to turn uh, a, a, an unusual pathway into the office into an advantage. Um, and I think we did that by drawing a very strong contrast with a very wonderful and progressive guy, Warren Tolman, who we were running against in the primary, um, by saying ultimately that our race was going to be about uh, a different kind of experience to be attorney general and really leading with that all the time. Somebody who'd been there, been doing the work, and really been making the case for Massachusetts voters. So I think we did that successfully, but the most important thing that we did candidly was raise all the money. We knew that we were gonna lose unless we raised $800,000 to put on television, and we had to do that. Um, we had about 11 months to do it, and then we spent all of it in 13 days in an ad where Mora spun a basketball on her finger, and um, so that's sort of, so that's how we won. <laughs> uh, uh, what does it say about Massachusetts politics moving forward? I guess a few things really quickly. One, 
at least if you are running in our party, the Democratic Party, uh, you ignore the grassroots at your peril. We did a, we built a campaign around the premise that progressive activists who put their time and their hearts into campaigns were gonna win us our campaign. We didn't have elected officials joining us or sort of building the sort of traditional uh, system, so we had to go a different way. But I think out of that sort of that sort of necessity is the mother of invention strategy uh, that you've seen with candidates like Deval Patrick, um, we built something that was really exciting and, and people felt engaged. They felt like they were needed. And so you wanna create that urgency and I think we did that successfully and campaigns in the future should do that too. Um, Massachusetts now recognizes that women should do all these jobs. And, um, and that's something that I'm committed to. I've been very privileged to work for great women candidates in my career, like Jean Shaheen, like Hillary Clinton, uh, our next president, like, um, like Elizabeth Warren, uh, the incomparable. So um, that's happening. And it's gonna change the way that the next generation thinks when they picture a politician in their head. It's, and um, I guess finally, uh, we're gonna have to figure out this money thing because television advertising, I mean, people say people don't watch this stuff, people say people don't notice, but it is still the way that we get our message out there and there is nothing taking its place. Not social media, that's important. Not uh, print advertising, certainly. Um, not sort of word of mouth. If you don't get yourself out there and have people know who you are, uh, you cannot win these campaigns. So that's out there. I think what's gonna fill the void is still to be determined, but uh, it's gonna be an interesting time when, uh, when we get there. So anyway, thank you very much. Don't leave just yet, couple of questions. Uh, do you recall a particularly difficult decision or like a most difficult decision? Did you ever like have a Hamlet moment where you're just hemming and hawing and going, what do I do? Or do you just not have time for that? Yeah, I mean, you can't, you cannot uh, have a lot of angst about your decision making because you've, you've got to move on to the next day. You've got to move on to the next fundraiser and the next, you know, uh, you know pitching a reporter to maybe cover you. But Good I, setup for our next speaker, by the way. Nicely done but, right there. Yeah. But um, I would say, uh, yeah, the hardest decision was, and I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, we had finally almost raised the money that we thought we needed to uh, go up on television, run a campaign. And then we said, well, do we have enough? And the answer was, you have enough to run a television ad, but if you do this, you can't do any digital advertising, I mean online. You can't do any print advertising. You can't afford any radio. I'm sorry, we couldn't afford any radio advertising. We don't have advertising anyway on um, this station, so. <laughs> but just, you know, uh, the medium, the medium. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, and they said, are you okay with that? And we had to sort of say, well, you know, and that's like putting all of your eggs literally in one basket. And we just had to have faith that that was going to work. And it's crazy that campaigns come down to these sorts of decisions, but that was, so that, that kept me up nights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about election day? Is that, is that particularly, like what, is It is crazy? so boring as a campaign manager. <laughs> election day, you have nothing to do. So I'll tell you a true story. Uh, I went and I held a sign at Holy Name in West Roxbury, which is the most uh, popular precinct, I mean, the most heavy voting precinct in the city. Uh, my boss went there uh, first thing in the morning and I was there holding a sign, but we actually had like a bunch of volunteers there and they were a little annoyed, like I'm here holding a sign, so like why are you here holding a sign? So then I went to another place down the street, there's a library where they vote, and there was also a volunteer there who was like passing out material for Mora and she understandably also was like, I have claimed this turf, like you need to go. Uh, so then I drove to my childhood precinct uh, at the Heath School in Brookline uh, and then just like stood on the street and like passed out literature. And we have like oppressive um, election uh, officials at the Heath School who really enforce the sort of like, you can't be within 150, so you have to stand like way in the street. And like people are going by and anyway, so that's, and, and then like one person, actually an old boss of mine uh, showed up to vote and uh, I, like was just handing out literature sort of and, and he's like, Mike, what, what are you, what, like, 
are you, you're here right now just like handing out literature? And I was like, I seriously have nothing else to do. So that's, that's All the decisions had been made. Basically. <laughs> uh, final question. Uh, is there a, a movie or a book that you think really like captures the experience of being on a campaign well? The greatest book about our business is called What It Takes. And it is about uh, the 1988 presidential campaign and the stories of six of the candidates, including uh, one of my heroes, uh, and I know Chris is too, uh, Governor Mike Dukakis. And uh, the prose is beautiful, and uh, it is the most insightful book that I know about our business. There you go. Mike Firestone, let's hear it for him. So I work for the Herald, as he said, and I've been there for about a year. I work the healthcare beat. So four out of five days a week, I'm writing about healthcare, I'm writing about medical innovations. Um, my fifth day of work every week, which is Saturday, because reporters never ever have normal schedules, um, I go to New Hampshire usually for political events. So this has been going on for about the past seven months. Started out with sort of intimate, uh, town hall style gatherings and it's grown into big rallies. And so most Saturdays I'm driving about an hour and a half away. Uh, and I guess what I try to do when I get there, which is what most reporters try to do, is you want a story that other reporters are not getting. But that's impossible at these things because they're public events and there are ton there's tons of media there, there are tons of people there, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands. So everybody's hearing the exact same speeches every time, which I've come to sort of mouth along with because I've heard them a lot. And if you're lucky, there's a press conference before or after. And sometimes you can ask questions. Sometimes you don't get to. Even if you do get to, they're not always the answers you want to hear. They're not sufficient. They're just canned answers. Um, so that's not really where the color comes from when you're covering these things. It's, it's really more about the people. And New Hampshire has some really interesting people. And that's the most fun part about covering it for me. So what I try to do is I get there, I do the press check-in, which is generally much earlier than the event starts. And then I wait around, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And I go immediately to the people. So. The cool thing about New Hampshire voters is that they get to meet these candidates so early in the game that they can take forever to form an opinion about them. Um, when I first started covering this several months ago, I would go up to people and I would ask them. I'd say, you know, what do you think? You just attended this house party. What do you think of this candidate? And they sort of sounded like they were in the dating scene. They'd kind of be like, well, I'm just here to kind of feel this person out a little bit just want to see if we mesh. They were okay, you know, but I have other people I want to check out too. And, and they kind of maintain that for a really long time. So even though there are big rallies now and there are tons of really loud supporters, there are also, you know, people who are just undecided. They come and they say, eh, I still don't really know. There are things I like about them, things that I don't. So I think as a reporter, like I said, it's really important to me to go and get the story from the people. And how many of you have been to a political event where you're, where you're there to hear the person speak, whether it is to show support or to find out more about them? Whoa, okay. How many of you guys would talk to a reporter there about your political beliefs? Nice. How many of you guys would have to know about what publication they work for first? <laughs> Okay, that's where the problem comes in sometimes. So, um, you know, the, the reaction of the people that I approach, it really varies. And sometimes people are like, oh, you're from the Herald. That's, that's the good one. I'm like, ah, you're going to talk to me. Thank you. And then sometimes it's like, the Herald? Okay. No, no, I'm good. No, we're good. So it really, really depends. But um, I think that one of the first times that I really realized how unpredictable it was was when I went to a Trump rally in August. And it was about a week after, if you'll recall, the Megyn Kelly debacle, um, where he got himself into a bit of trouble by saying that there was blood coming out of her wherever. Um, and, 
And I, so I went there and I thought, okay, there are going to be people who support him, but who knows what they're going to be thinking after that, you know? And I, I was especially interested in talking to the women there to see what they thought. And so I made it, immediately I went to the front of the line because that's usually where the most animated people are because they've been there for hours and hours. And I approached this woman who was in her late 70s probably. And as it turns out, she was there with her two teenage grandsons and actually her daughter who was working, um, who was volunteering there as well. And I asked her what she thought of Trump and then I asked her you know, if the Megyn Kelly situation had changed anything and she, she kind of scowled and she said, is Fox News here? And I said, oh, I don't know. She said, if you see them, tell them I have boycotted them and I think that Megyn Kelly was in the wrong and I think that you know, she should really be respecting her elders and she was furious and I kind of almost felt like I was getting reprimanded in her place. Um, and I just sat back and thought, I have no idea what to expect at these things. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to come and see a th three generations in a family supporting Trump and the matriarch um, very, very angry at this woman reporter. So, and that was at a point when analysts and pundits were saying things like, oh, Trump really shot himself in the foot. Megyn Kelly is very beloved among, among Republicans. So at that point, I really realized being on the ground, talking to voters, that's really where you get the color. That's really where you get a sense of what's going on. Um, so anyway, that's my, I have lots of anecdotes. I have lots of fun experiences from covering the campaign. Feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. All right, all right. I have a, a couple of quick questions for you. One, sure. um, it's sort of a two-part question. Uh, one being, in the coverage that you've done, is if you could sort of pick one moment where you felt really hopeful and excited about the democratic process, and one where you felt really like, oh man, this is ugly. Have, have you had those kind of lows and highs? I think, for the most part, it feels very hopeful. Um, when you're out there and when there's, there are so many people who are so passionate, and that's another thing about New Hampshire voters also, that they're, they, they are so hopeful and they are so involved in the process. And especially when the, the rallies started to grow and you have kind of the, the loud screaming and cheering and the huge numbers of people who show up. And that's a really powerful thing. I mean, even if you don't necessarily support the candidate yourself, to see that and to see that show of support and to see those people come, um, that's, always, that's always a really hopeful thing. How about the ugly side? Does it rear its head? Well, the ugly side, of course, is um, when the talk gets ugly. I mean, Another thing from the Trump rally that I went to is that he, he has a tendency to say things that are a little inflammatory. Um, I think at the one that I went to, he called Marty Walsh a clown. And, that, that did happen at and, one point. And he said that, that he had done more for women than Charlie Baker would ever do. Um, so there's a lot of, there's, there's some nasty talk that comes out of it too. There's some attacking. And that's never a fun thing to see, but that's, that's politics. Lindsay Coulter, Boston Herald, everybody. Thank you. I'm an urban planner in the first place. Uh, went to MIT, served in Menino's administration, um, started the state's open data initiative, and now I'm uh, the managing director at a civic engagement lab at Emerson College. So civic engagement is what I do. It's what I've been doing for the past 10 years altogether. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I started to run in the first place. Um, you know, as a... As an urban planner, you, you work in politics, you're continually working in transportation, housing, economic development, education, and what you realize at the end of the day is all of these decisions ultimately come down to politics. And that can be, you know, that can be frustrating. And so the reason why I decided to run was I looked at our council and I didn't necessarily see a council that was representative of and reflective of the, of the people of Cambridge. You know, there's only one woman on council right now out of nine city councilors total. There, um, 
you know, you look a little bit deeper into the campaign finance piece, which is a part that I was most surprising as a first-time candidate. Um, I thought that campaign finance reform was something that, you know, was, you know, the city more or less had it figured out, but at the state and at the federal levels, that's where you really needed to be um, more more aware of campaign finance. But actually, you know, seven of our nine current city councilors, um, looking at their OCPF, their Office of Campaign and Political Finance Records, uh, accept up to 30% of their campaign finance contributions from corporate real estate development interests. And um, right now there's an affordable housing crisis in Cambridge. So there's a serious, serious conflict of interest and those were the reasons why I decided to run in the first place. And it was a really, really fun experience. That was the other surprising thing, was that it was incredibly fun. Um, and as an urban planner, you're cont you always want to know what drives people. You always want to know what people want in their city and what they're missing in their city. And so I had an excuse. I had an excuse to walk up to anyone any time on the street and be like, hey, what do you care about in your city? What do you care about in Cambridge? What do you want to see change in Cambridge? You know, and I had some surprising answers, but I think the most regular answer was, um, I'm concerned about being able to live here. I'm concerned, I, w I really want to stay in Cambridge. I love Cambridge, I adore Cambridge, but I am worried that I'm not, I'm going to be priced out and not going to be able to live here. So that was um, interesting. Oh, I have just a few more minutes. So to, to wrap things up, um, you know, the other surprising thing in Cambridge is that, you know, there's 110,000 people, more or less. Only 66,000 of those people actually registered to vote. And then only set a little over 17,000 of those people showed up in this year's municipal election. So it's a small, it's a small percentage. There's a crazy proportional representation system here in Cambridge, which is, you know, a, basically a rank voting system, and it allows you to rank your candidates. And so I didn't win, but I came incredibly close. I lost by about 150 votes out of over 17,000 cast. And, um, you know, with, with the uh, campaign finance piece, we had candidates that raised up to $73,000 and still lost. Um, and I was in the same point spread as them, which was pretty exciting. So, <laughs> so um, money is not necessarily an indicator of, of winning in a Cambridge election. But I want to say a few things about starting your own campaign and running your own campaign is that what was also really exciting is that it seems to be, it felt like a startup in a lot of ways. Um, my husband has his own tech company and he would often I, I would come home and he would be like, oh, I recognize this. This is, mu this is me in like month two of my startup. You're building a team. You are pitching the product, but the product is actually yourself, which is a little bit of a weird thing. And then you're going to different investors, which are your constituents. You're trying to raise your own funds. And the, the ideal is that actually you get small donations over and over again to amass a large financial base. Um, that is, I mean, I think that's the, that's the uh, value of a true grassroots uh, effort. But then oftentimes, you know, in most municipal elections, now that I, now that I really know the inside baseball, um, you know, it comes down to a lot of really wealthy donors that, uh, you know, sit on the board of directors for real estate development companies and write personal checks. So that's, that's oftentimes how it works. But um, come talk to me. I'd love to talk about m politics, why w more women should run. Uh, women, there just simply aren't enough women in politics. I, there was only five out of 23 candidates. I was the youngest by about 20 years. Um, and, you know, we just need, we need more representation and more diversity in government. Thank you. Stay there, stay there. Um, what do you know about Cambridge? How long have you lived in Cambridge, been in Cambridge? A little over five years. All right, so what do you know about it today that you did not know when you started your campaign? Oi. <laughs> we could do a different question if you want. But uh, seriously, I mean, you had to have, in talking to people, doing, you know, going in front of groups, listening to constituents, getting an understanding. What, what did you learn about the city where you live? Well, I, I mean, I would say that one of the more surprising uh, anger points was around leaf blowers. That, I had no idea. I would get emails like, 
Ms. Davidson, what is your stance on leaf blowers? And I was like, oh, okay, I need to have a stance on leaf blowers. I didn't know, I didn't know they made people so angry. Where did so, you end up coming down on leaf blowers? Well, apparently, I did a little research and apparently they are really bad for the environment. They, really? Yeah, yeah, they, they're, you know, they're a noise pollutant, but they're also an air pollutant as well. Hmm. So. Totally against them then. <laughs> oh, they do Not have totally, value. I mean, you Not gotta, totally. you know, you leave a little wiggle room. Uh, you know, I, 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 I ask this question a lot of times with people who like start a business or, uh, or the like, you know, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people think about, you know, they're in their job and they're like, you know, someday if I had my own business, I would do this or I would do that. And I think sometimes people would say, you know, if I were president or if I, you know, if I were in charge, I would do X or Y or Z. Most people never take the step to actually try it. They never actually get there. What was the thing that, you know, you sort of you hinted at it. You said, I'm trying to do my work, and I realized it came from the book. But, like, not only did you think, like, oh, that sucks, and complain about it, either out loud or to yourself, you actually ran. You said, this is something I can do. Why? How? Was there a moment? You just do it. I mean, I mean at, at the end of the day, like, maybe this sounds a little corny, but you don't want to let you don't want to let silly things like fear stop you. So you just do it and if, you know, do the best that you can. And I, you know, as I said, what was really surprising but also, um, you know, exhilarating was that it was fun and it was fun, it was really fun. And part of the fun is being able to, as I said, walk up to anyone and talk to them about what was important in their city. You gonna run again? Probably. <laughs> We'll see. Let's never hear say for never. it. Let's hear for it. Yeah. Uh, one of the people out in the crowd was saying to me, uh, he, he basically said, there's an elephant in the room here in that we're talking about politics tonight. Nobody's mentioned the fact that, relatively speaking, everybody up here is young. And young or youth is not necessarily what you always think about when you think about politics from any side of it, whether that be a campaign manager or a candidate or the reporters who are covering them. Uh, so I want to talk briefly with you guys. Just I want to throw that out there to you. Is that something you guys are aware of? Are you aware of the fact, or, or, or is it a fallacy? Are we unaware of how many young people are involved in politics? Or as you kind of go about your days, your lives, getting into this, are you looking out and saying, like, gosh, there are a lot of people way older than me in this? So I don't care which one of you guys wants to start. Who's got it? Who's got it? Who wants to jump in on that? You do. You have a you have a mic. I do. Okay. Yeah, you do. Well, I, I'm a reporter, so I'm coming at it from a different angle. Yep. I um, first of all have plenty of gray hair, so that carries me through. <laughs> but um, no, I think for me, it's it's more about it being a boys' club than it is about being young. You know, there are a lot of men in the business, and uh, I feel that for sure. I think, but I do think that there. Are certainly more young reporters than there are young people in politics. Those of you in politics, true? Uh, well, I think that, I mean, when I think about the campaigns that I've worked on, and I've worked on a bunch, uh, they're a tremendous training ground for people in their 20s. So, I mean, I think politics, the business of politics, is, is really a young person's game in many cases. Um, and hopefully, and I think you've seen through the incredible participation in campaigns like, like the president's two campaigns that you have uh, a generation of people who are inspired to engage in grassroots politics and then, you know, courageously in some cases, uh, you know, uh, throw their hat in the ring. So I think hopefully, as has been done in previous generations, you are seeing uh, a lot of people sort of step in and step up. I would agree with that, and then I would also push back and say that in municipal elections, that's the anomaly in a lot of ways, is that there are so many, pe so many young people that uh, self-identify as civically engaged and politically active and politically aware and passionate and voters, but for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's not their hometown and they're saving their vote for a presidential election where they think they're in a swing state and that matters. Um, that was the, that was an excuse that I heard a lot on the on the campaign trail. But um, 
you know, municipal government is really where the rubber hits the road, and that's really where you can make a difference in where your vote can truly make a difference. And so I would advocate for everyone to get more involved at the municipal level as well. I mean, I guess, so again, there's no doubt that, like, municipal government is, in many cases, the elected officials are older people who are established homeowners in the communities. But, I mean, if you, I mean, we, we just had the resignation of, you know, leadership at the University of Missouri because of a, a student activism, and there's not a single, you know, chair of no Boston Olympics who's 35. So, you know, I think that... Uh, people are discovering different ways to get involved. Um, I, well, I, I'll just, I think everything also is cyclical and this is a cycle. You have us up here um, demonstrating a big year in politics in Boston and um, that I think, look at George Stephanopoulos. I mean, he was like Clinton's guy. I mean, like Des, yeah. you could be on ABC soon. I mean, who knows? I think it's just... You're welcome. Um, it's just a matter of things are, this is just a moment in time and we're all here because we have a shared passion and a shared interest. So yes, we are young professionals, but that is cyclical and there'll be another one and hopefully we'll be mentors to them. I mean, do you ever, do you guys ever in doing what you do, in doing what you do, do you, do you feel your youth or, you know, do you get, the feeling that somebody's kind of looking at you like you're young or that you're in a room with people who are much older than you or is it or is it just like any other job you're just it's a mix i'll start i'll echo that we it's more the woman thing that's incredibly unique and very challenging and it's very lonely out on that ledge so there was a theme to this a little bit and you know, Mike's so amazing with Moore's historic campaign, but um, there's something that's more gender specific, I think, than age specific in that, that's unique and year of the women or whatnot, but we've been saying that a lot. I think there's something there that should be unearthed and more excavated. How do you do that? Uh, good question. <laughs> I'm going to hand this microphone to somebody else. No, but how, I mean, you've run for office. It, it, it means that, it, you know, and, and we're you know, just a few minutes ago, sort of saying we need more women to run. I mean, is it as simple as more women need to run? I mean, I really think that pe people, more people don't run, but more specifically, women don't run because it, it, it's um, isolating and you don't see as many peers or mentors out there that you can model yourself after. You know, a, a, learning to be a candidate is actually its own special thing. It's, it's, not, it's not running a campaign and it's not um, learning to be a decent public speaker. It's actually, there's a, actually a way to learn to be a candidate. And you can't model yourself after any of the male counterparts because it's just a completely different thing. And so I think it can be really difficult as, as a young woman candidate especially. Um, and I was one of two female minority candidates on the whole ballot as well. So that's, that's another element as, as well to, to add on, on to that. It's, it can be, yeah, I mean it is tough and isolating when you're out there kind of on your own. I think that there's also an advantage in being younger. I think that, I mean, people were talking about social media earlier. There's obviously an element that's of being young that's helpful in that. I, I know that at 32, I feel like a Luddite compared to a lot of 25 year olds who are using Twitter uh, more successfully than I am. So I think that there's, there are a lot of things to be said for kind of being a native in that uh, digital generation too. I mean, I uh, have spent 10 years trying to get women elected to office, and I think we have a lot of reason to be hopeful here in Massachusetts. And, you know, look, honestly, Cambridge has a really messed up way of voting, and that's why you lost. So, you know, next time, I'm sure, when you run again, I'm sure you'll win. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, they have a system of voting w which the candidates can't explain to the voters, and the voters don't understand when they go into the polls. So hopefully somebody will change that too. But in Boston, uh, let's not forget that, uh, you know, a week ago Tuesday, um, the two longest serving members of the Boston City Council were ousted by two young, uh, dynamic women who said it is time to change the face of uh, our politics here in Boston. And, you know, I think, I think 
there will continue to be more of this. And look, as somebody who works in this business, I got to tell you, um, if you are out there and you are speaking with some authenticity and some conviction, I think pretty soon and just given the gender splits in our, uh, in our elections because women vote more and women vote more democratic, um, it's going to start being an advantage. And that's an exciting thing. And I think we use that in my boss's election, and hopefully that's a roadmap for other people. So uh, last question. I want you guys to all kind of take a crack at answering this, and then we can all go home. But, you know, I think we're in a place and a time, and look, there have been many places in times like this. You go back through the years, you read people's quotes from, you know, Mark Twain to Sophocles about politics and politicians, and it always, it always has been to some extent a dirty game or something that people can look at and kind of roll their eyes at or whatever. But it feels like we're in a particularly divisive time in politics. There seems to be a lot of people who kind of look at politics and feel like their elected officials either don't represent them or there's, you know, Congress is intractable or whatever it is. What's your best pitch to all of us here for not being cynical about where we, where we are in our political climate or in the idea of we go, we vote, for, we vote for candidates or we have a cause and we take it to the people. What is your guys who are in this, who have put your time and effort and energy into this, what's your pitch to us to not be cynical? I'll start. Um, well, No Boston Olympics was the three young professionals against the $75 million best of Boston, most powerful of Boston, and we won. So if anything, <laughs> that illustrates an example of, it's inspiring to me still. So in that regard, I think that's just one example. Sometimes you just need to be reminded that sometimes that can occur. So it hopefully will you know, inspire other people. Who else wants to take it? Who else wants to go? I would say it's okay to be cynical. I would say it's not okay to be complacent. So what other choice do you have, really? I mean, you can sit by and do nothing, or you can make an effort. But it's okay to have a little cynicism in there. It's okay to be um, negative sometimes. It's okay to be even angry. Uh, but just don't, don't sit by and be idle. Couldn't have said it better, but be the change you want to see in the world. I think the most inspiring sort of togetherness moment of my entire life, and I don't know who was there, but did anyone else go to Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009, right? Like, wasn't that just the most inspiring moment for all of us? And yeah, it was a little while ago now, but there were like three million people on the National Mall and there were interviews with people in every newspaper in the country who had driven there from every single place in the country to put their children on their shoulders and say, this is the country we live in. So, and then if you think about what happened in the first 18 months of the Obama administration, you know, the Affordable Care Act and the Dodd-Frank Act and the Serve America Act and the Recovery Act, like we've had moments of real productivity and positive change. So. Here in Massachusetts, uh, we passed the most expansive sick leave law in the country, you know, on the ballot, you know, uh, 53 weeks ago. And so we are, we are making progress and we gotta keep fighting for it. I think voters are desperately hopeful and the great, you know, opportunity we have is to tap into that. All right, let's hear it for the month. Let's hear it for every one of these guys here. And for yourselves, thank you guys for coming out to GBH tonight and being with us for Boston Talks. The young, especially, and people in general, don't have much of a clue about what food is and where it comes from, the difference between healthy and nutritious, um, and don't know much about what the future is holding. 